There was a five meter swell, the sea was so rough. We're preparing for battle. There are 52 knots. The conditions have been really extreme. There were gusts of 60 to 65 knots on the windward side. It's more than just tough in these conditions. It's survival. The further behind you were, the harder you were hit. That's what's crazy. I was really scared. It was truly infernal. It was crazy, completely crazy. In 2020, due to the COVID pandemic, the Vendée Globe finished behind closed doors, without the usual excitement that accompanies the traditional return up the canal into Les Sables de Lomme. The Vendée Arctique is the first of five qualifying races for the 2024 Vendée Globe, so the skipper's primary aim is to finish in order to qualify, and then get as many miles as possible under their belts in order to become one of the 40 sailors selected for the Vendée Globe. For me, it's first and foremost a qualifying race because it's a step towards the Vendée Globe, and then it's a work race. Fourteen foiling boats, eleven with dagger boards, the fleet has rarely been so competitive at all levels. Charlie Dallin, Jeremy Bayou and Thomas Rouillon, on proven reliable boats, which they'll change before the next Vendée Globe race, are the big favourites amongst the foilers. Bayou, sailing Chiral, won the first edition of the Vendée Arctique. It is a great memory, but now two years on, we have a Vendée Globe race under our belts and we'll go again. Uh, toujours avec le même bateau uh, que je connais maintenant par cœur et ça sera For the dernière. final time, uh, I'll be in the same boat I know so well. And like the last time, I want to be in the battle at the front of the fleet. If the result turns out the same, I'll take it. In the daggerboard category, are two young newcomers to the Imoka class. Sailing older boats are Benjamin Ferret and Girek Soudé, two young sailors from Breton, bringing a breath of fresh air to the class. We like the kids in ski school, do you know? That's why we're still in learning mode, uh, even if uh, Benji doesn't say it, he has much better boat than, uh, than mine. But yeah, the idea is uh, to continue to accumulate experience and to be ready for the Rome race uh, this year. And the final goal is the Vendée Globe in 2024. And this is a crazy trip, because uh, none of the skippers have raced this route before. It would be fun to try out a new route. Solid start, 3, 2, 1, and stop! The wind's lighter than expected, and on flat seas, the second edition of the Vendée Arctique got underway in the late afternoon, in the Bay of Le Sable de Lon. Due to stronger winds expected later that evening, some competitors chose to start with reduced sails. The foilers accelerated away and headed west-southwest at over 20 knots. Charlie Dallin, Louis Burton, Benjamin Dutro, Thomas Rouillant leading the charge. Nicholas Lundbun was the only daggerboard boat to also head west. The others opted to head further north, with Louis Duke choosing the northernmost route. The focus is on getting ahead with a first night at full speed before hitting a windless zone around midday on Monday. On board Bureau Valley, a few minutes after the start, it's flying, it's whistling, and uh, that's what we call a tough start. Rarely has a fleet of racing boats gone so fast, averaging more than 25 knots over 12 hours the leaders staying within a few miles of each other before heading north on Monday. Charlie Dallin, Louis Burton, Thomas Rouillon and Jeremy Bayou on the westernmost route are almost within touching distance of each other. We are side by side with Bureau Valley, 
and then Shiral, who's behind. I don't know if we can see him right now. And we have Apivia, who we are starting to see in front. So we are well grouped. The conditions are a bit calmer than last night, that's for sure. It was really fast at the start of the Vendée Arctique. The boat was extremely fast last night. I'd like to see the best average speed over an hour. It must be quite good. Problems with his hydraulic keel forced Zobi Verech back to Le Sable de Lon. Unable to repair it quickly, the Hungarian officially retired on Monday afternoon. Entry into the windless high-pressure zone saw the gaps in the fleet disappear over Monday and Tuesday. Apivia was the first to come through it and accelerated away, leaving the others struggling to chase her. Those who chose the more northern route led the leaderboard because of their more direct route. Benjamin Ferre and Girek Sude refound the wind on Tuesday at midday. To be honest, this ridge of high pressure and the lack of wind is breaking my heart. Yes, I worked hard and paid off. Uh, I have Robin Tanasio and Comrade Coleman in sight uh, over there on the horizon, so that's pretty good. And now I have Sebastian Marcel right here. Side by side with uh, Fabrice Amedeo, we're still in the high pressure ridge, a ridge that we're trying to cross. After so much effort watching the wind and adapting their sail plans in the high pressure zone, the sailors had a dozen or so hours to attack at speed before facing another front expected in the early hours of Wednesday. The fleet turned further north and began to spread, creating an unlikely scenario in which the older daggerboard boats were leading thanks to a more direct route. A second windless zone in the Irish Sea was to prove too much for some competitors. Already exhausted by the first few hours of hard racing, the fleet began to drift apart with some stuck for hours. The three daggerboard boats of Louis Duc, Antoine Kornick and Dennis van Weinberg gave up trying to cross the high pressure zone, instead choosing to follow a narrow corridor along the Irish coast, which involved continuous jibing. For those who stayed west, it proved a disaster. At moments like these, when it's grey, it's raining, there's no wind, you feel like you're making uh, the wrong choice. Well, uh, we didn't make much progress today. Uh, it's a disaster, be calmed all day. Once again, Charlie Dallin took advantage and was the first to pick up speed at the end of the day. Leading since heading west, he was able to position himself perfectly to pass the two weather fronts and benefit from the establishing winds. The move increased his advantage and put him top of the leaderboard, effectively KOing his two closest rivals who just couldn't keep up. By Wednesday, they were resigned to their fate. The situation is not simple. It's changing in front of us, so I think it will lead uh, to big gaps in the fleet. I certainly did not want to find myself in this situation. Only a PVS ahead, and the more you're in front, the easier it's to get away. So uh, he's going to build a lot of distance. It was the latest show of strength from Dallin, and thoroughly appreciated by informed observer Vincent Ryu, winner of the 2005 Vendée Globe. Voilà, Charlie, c'est aujourd'hui lui qui a le bateau le plus rapide. Charlie is the one uh, whose boat is fastest, most versatile, and best in medium conditions. Um, they now have the best possible conditions to get going after the two or three difficult days they've had. Charlie is the best equipped to take advantage. Uh, he's uh, a virtuoso of single-handed sailing who's becoming more and more confident. His boat's fast, he already makes navigational mistakes, so I think he's the complete package the man and the machine. It's the harmony between him and his boat. And that doesn't leave much room for the others. It's the result of a lot of work he has done with his team. And you can only be happy for him. Meanwhile, on land, trouble was brewing for the race directors. 
a worrying weather pattern was developing that would make the approach to Iceland far more complicated than expected. A large low pressure system from the west was deepening by the hour and moving towards Iceland, threatening to cut off the fleet's route. On board the 24 boats, the sailors were also getting anxious. This is the weather situation as we approach uh, Iceland. It means uh, we'll have to focus on being good sailors and put the race aside until the depression passes over. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the committee do. It's a tough decision because Charlie is so far ahead. How do you now create a course that doesn't favour some and penalise others? The answer is I don't think you can. However, they need to be pragmatic because none of us want to break our boats and 15 knots is not a place that you ever want to be. La direction de course uh, ce matin. This morning, uh, race management decided de not to take the sailors around Iceland, but instead to use these gates as a turning point to head out to the Atlantic waypoint. Unfortunately, we are not going around Iceland anymore, and I'll show you why. This isn't fun, especially this part where it's 40 knots and uh, even 45 to 50 knots, and the rest is pretty bad too. It's just a big red pad that fills the screen, and when it's like that, you think, okay, where do I go to stay safe? On Thursday, the fleet continued its climb towards Iceland. At last, Dalan's challengers had found some speed. Bayou and Rouillon finally got past the daggerboard boats. Ce matin, qui on voit? This morning, who do we see? Et Hello, bonjour, Thomas Rouillon. The bulk of the fleet was now far behind with the strengthening following wind. Whilst boat speed increased, temperatures were dropping. Don't want to make you seasick, but look, the speed is on the top right of the screen. 20 knots. It's crazy. You feel like you're on a windsurf, except it's actually an 18-metre sailboat. Then, at around 10pm, there was drama. With the forecast getting even worse, the race directors decided to suspend the race at the gate off Iceland. Their hope? To restart it once the depression had passed. So we'll have to stand by and wait for the decisions of the race management. After four days at sea, in broad daylight, at 2 a.m. on Friday morning, Charlie Dallin reached the gate of Iceland. Yes, yes first on the neutralization line. Uh, we'll have to see what develops, but uh, at least uh, this part is done. Jeremy Bayou, who found some extra speed on his approach to Iceland, crossed the line three hours and 43 minutes behind Apivia. Then it was Thomas Rouillard's turn to cross the virtual line seven hours behind Dallin. All three were told by race management to take shelter in a fjord on the east coast and wait for a new decision. Dallin and Rouillon took refuge at anchor before the worst of the storm arrived. Bayou opted to stay offshore, but away from the Icelandic coast. The low pressure system swept across the Icelandic sea, hitting the back of the fleet hard. The heavy seas pounded the sailors and forced them into damage limitation. Manu Kuza, who'd taken shelter near Ireland, was forced to abandon the race and head back to Les Sables de Lot. It's a big fight. It's a very big fight. Today has not been one of my favourite days at sea. Um, it's been really hard and it's not over yet. It seems like every second I'm being challenged there's a new problem. And every time I think I'm getting on top of it, something else happens. Oh my goodness. There are 52 knots. At midnight on Friday, race director Francis Le Goff and his team took a tough decision. Because of the terrible weather, they declared the race finish would be at the Icelandic gate. That meant Charlie Dalla was declared the winner while sheltering from the storm in an Icelandic fjord. It's the first time I've won a race whilst at anchor, so that's a first. In the following hours, 14 competitors reached that gate and the finish line. Some chose to head south immediately, others took a few hours rest in the lee of the land. But the conditions were particularly difficult with violent winds blowing down from Iceland's glaciers. We moved into a second phase, which was dealing with the back of the fleet. They really had to show fighting spirit because the conditions were huge. 
et euh, avoir pu euh, continuer they no option but to continue and they had to fight for the smallest place to get to the finish line pour arriver jusque la ligne parfois on demande sometimes you wonder if what you're doing isn't very clever Well, this is Iceland, my friend, and you're fighting upwind in 35 knots to get to that finish line. I've done some hard things in my life, but this is a crazy thing. It's beautiful. But what an ordeal. The final ascent to the finish proved incredibly exhausting, as we saw in Roman Atanasio's raw emotion after 48 hours of brutal conditions. Shit, I thought I would never pass this bloody line with this exploding mainsail. The sea is rotten. The boat was banging, almost sounding like breaking glass. If that happens, the boat is destroyed. Thank God, it's over. For Arnaud Boissier, Isabel Joschk and Denis Van Weyberg, it was too much. After two hellish days, deprived of their headsails and suffering serious damage, they decided to abandon the race. Finally, the last three. Conrad Coleman, Fabrice Amadeo and Kojiro Shiraishi finished on Saturday evening, six days into a strange but instructive race. This race has been wild since the beginning and uh, not the best race, res race result ever. But let me tell you, I'm pleased it's over, but it's built good things for the rest of the season, so I decided to get stuck in. And now, I'm excited to celebrate crossing that finish line. Cheers. It was really tough and I'm super proud to have finished this one. It was really hard work to get here and uh, the reward is great. Ah, the bloody reward. It feels so good. The return trip to Le Sable de Lon was a calmer affair and the skippers entered the canal of Portolona on Thursday the 23rd of June. They were finally able to share their feelings, and for Charlie Dalla, it was a chance to savour his victory. Um, there was the virtual line crossing, and then they announced my win, so uh, it didn't really sink in. But it's starting too now. <laughs> I'll remember everything about this race. It was tough. Tough because you never know what you're facing from one day to the next. Race length doesn't really matter because the weather conditions are so tricky in this part of the world that you never know if it's going to be windy or not or if you're going to risk your life. That's what I find hardest. I think there were more ripped sails and damage in this race than in the last Vendée Globe. It was so tough up there. I'm very pleased with this race. Uh, I learned a million things, a million things. It was super intense, uh, which is what we were looking for, and found on this uh, Vendée Arctic race. Despite the shortening of this second edition of the Vendée Arctique, it'll be remembered as a race that kept its promises, dedication and adventure in unfamiliar seas. Hey!